Today, we are looking at cross-site request forgery um, and the confused deputy problem, which is a, uh, an example. Cross-site request forgery is an example of a confused deputy problem. So CSERF or cross-site request forgery or CSRF or XSRF less, less often or session writing or hostile linking or Microsoft sometimes call it a one-click attack um, is, is what we're talking about today. And essentially, um, it's when you manage to, I guess, through some clever trickery, get someone's web browser to send through a command to a server that makes it look like the user had initiated that action. And as far as the server's concerned, the user's now asked for something to change, and the server will go, oh, OK, yeah, the user's asked me to delete a post or, or you know, send some money. And basically, the, the reason why it works is because when you log into a website in your web browser, and you authenticate, so you know you know this from a few weeks ago, we are talking about session management. So you type your password in or whatever else, and then it sets up a session with you. And then every time that that web browser initiates anything on that website, it'll send along all the cookies that are associated with that website, with that um, domain. And that will include session cookies. And then the server will receive that request and say, ah, oh, the user's just asked for this and they're logged in, I can see their cookie and everything's fine. So unfortunately, there's, it's very easy to trick a user into making a HTTPS or HTTP request. It's, uh, there's lots of ways that you can trick someone into making the request. Um, and if the, the, the issue is when that request is not initiated by a user willingly or knowingly understanding what that meant uh, and the server just like oh it's users asking for something so the kinds of requests that attackers are looking at or they wanted to initiate are the state changing requests so any request that is actually the server is going to carry out an instruction and do something to change the state of a database for example or, or carry out some action that's the kind of thing that this is going to um, you know, fall victim to this kind of attack. Uh, if there's no verification that it is an authenticated request, then your website will be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. It is a blind attack in that the attacker doesn't actually get to see what the user sees. The attacker basically does something that initiates the uh, HTTP request, the server then makes some change in response to that, but the attacker doesn't get to see any of those results. The attacker basically just triggers the thing to get started and then sits back and you know might see, for example, that they succeeded in transferring some money or deleting a post or changing someone's password or whatever it is. Um, if there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a website, then it's much worse because then obviously they can see what's happening, but not only, not only that, but pretty much all of the defenses that I'm going to talk about in the second part of this lecture, they all fall apart and don't work if you've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So the first step is not to have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, and then also let's make sure that we're not victim to like a CSERF vulnerability. So ways that you can trick someone into triggering this kind of request can be as simple as sending a link in an email. So you've got a link that says uh, that you want to make a post to Facebook, for example. And if you can make a post to Facebook just by basically creating a link um, and send that to someone and they click on it, that could be enough to trigger this kind of attack where you manage to get someone to post to Facebook, for example, by clicking a link in an email. Uh, likewise, you could send like URLs other ways, like via instant messages or however however else you communicate with someone. Uh, you could embed the link in a website and ask someone to click it. You could post a message to a forum and say, just click on this link for something. And, you know, obviously, so trying to trick someone into doing something like clicking on something. But not only that, the worst kinds of um, attacks happen when the user doesn't have to really do much at all or, or anything. 
Uh, it could be as simple as just browsing to a website and the website they visit manages to trigger the attack. So often, just by browsing a website, it can trigger various kinds of like activity within the web browser which will make the web browser send requests. So, for example, every time you visit a website that has pictures in it, so image tags in the HTML, the browser will happily go and get download those images and load them for you. The way that a web browser gets those images is to make an HTTP request based on the source of that image. So you can literally put the link that you wanted someone to click in as the source of an image, put that in an HTML file, get them to browse to it, and hey, the browser just does that for you. It will connect to the website and send that request through along with all the session information because the browser will automatically send all the cookies along every time it makes a request. So you can basically trick a web browser into sending all kinds of requests very easily. Create iframes that, that are for a URL. You can, um, you can have the, 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 if there are other kinds of um, HTTP requests like, um, like form fields that you're sending, you can embed all of that into a website um, and you could send it via JavaScript. So JavaScript can um, use hidden forms, for example, to like automatically submit a request to a website. Uh, and you can use uh, like AJAX requests, so XML HTTP requests, which are uh, basically within a website when it loads. You can use JavaScript to you know, make whatever queries you want to some external websites quite easy. So the, um, you know, all you need to do is basically create a malicious website and get them to visit that. So, uh, you know, they might just be browsing the internet, they come across this website and it's basically, um, you know, gets you to delete your Facebook account just by browsing to this, someone else's website is the, you know, worst case scenario where, you know, there's no defenses against this stuff. Stored CSRF flaws are when you can actually store the attack on the website itself. So for example, there might be like a message board and in that message board, you can embed the attack against that same message board. And every time someone loads, lo logs into it, they're basically automatically attacked and they, their web browser will go ahead and make some requests. So the confused deputy problem is when you're basically given some software, some privileges, so the software is allowed to do some stuff, but someone convinces that software into doing something that it's not supposed to do. So the classic, the classic example that's usually given when you're talking about confused deputy problem is like a C compiler. So like a remote C <coughs> compiler it's running on a separate server that you can send commands to and you say, okay, compile this C program. And if you're allowed to specify um, like uh, compiler options, you could say, well, the output of this thing, once you compile it, create a file called blah, and you could use that to basically overwrite some other file that exists and therefore do damage that you're not supposed to be able to do. So for example, the example that's usually given is I want to uh, output to like the billing database or something and it will basically like overwrite that whole database with, a, with that new compiled C program. So it's obviously tricking the software that's there into doing something that it's not supposed to do and basically as an attacker, if you can trick some software that's running into do, to doing something for you, then you can end up essentially taking the privileges or, or using this software that's running at a escalated privilege level um, and making it do something for you that enables you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't be allowed to do. So on a, uh, and we'll talk about this in more detail next year, we'll talk about access controls and things in more detail. But for example, on like a Linux system uh, or any Unix system, you've got certain programs that run with extra privileges than what other programs do on that computer. And if you have a program that um, is allowed to change your password, for example, in order to do that, it needs special privileges. And on a Unix system, it's called a set UID system. Um, uh, usually you'll have a program that actually gets to run as root privileges, for example. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail later. But basically, if you've got any program that's ever running with extra privileges, 
You have to be very careful to design it in a way where you're not accidentally going to be doing things on behalf of other people. So you need to be very careful about the requests that are being made to that software. Uh, and there are other examples of confused deputy problems like clickjacking, where you've got essentially websites that will trick the um, similar trick the browser and have some JavaScript running that will click on a bunch of ads that the user might not have even seen, for example, uh, but to you know drive up ad revenue, for example. Uh, and FTP balance attacks, where you get some FTP servers to send requests for you. Um, so CSA. So cross-site request forgery is a related problem because you've basically got a confused deputy in the web browser. So the web browser receives a request. It doesn't know, it doesn't understand that the user didn't, doesn't want it to send that request. It just happily sends across all the requests that it gets. Um, and sometimes they're coming from someone sending a malicious link. Sometimes they're coming from malicious things that are automatically happening in other websites. And sometimes you legitimately are logged into your bank and you're clicking a thing because you want to transfer some money to someone. So we need ways of stopping bad things from happening. But there's also the related idea of ambient authority. So because current modern computer systems often are designed or almost always are designed with this idea of ambient authority that basically because you are you, you're this user on a system, you get to do a whole bunch of stuff on your system. And when you like go to take an action, it goes, oh yeah, you're allowed to do that. Um, so it's fine kind of thing, rather than carefully thinking about, okay, this thing is designed at this point in time, I want this person to be able to do just this one thing. Uh, and then I might take that away from you afterwards. It's like, what's that? You want to go through this door? Well, at this moment you can. It doesn't necessarily mean that every time you want to walk through that door you can. But in this instance, because you've got your travel pass or whatever, you, you, your token, you can walk through that door. So, but most computer systems are not designed uh, to be uh, basically holding all the keys, as it were, to all of the things that you might want to do and only being allowed into those. Uh, so that's known as a capability system. But instead, most computer systems, security systems are designed more like on ACLs like access control lists and designed more where essentially you're allowed to do stuff and um, there's a whole bunch of things that you may or may not do at any particular point in time. But so it's, that's the, essentially the problem here is we've got web browsers that at any point they're allowed to, you know, make if at, if at any point you've designed your website so that literally you just make this a request to transfer money and there's no checking that it makes sense in the context of all the other stuff that's going on then you've got a very broken website. So there's essentially two main um, like attacks, or uh, I guess it depends on the, uh, the kind of HTTP request that happens, depends on the way that you craft your attack. So get requests are when, um, you know, you, probably you know you understand this by now but basically with get requests you've got a URL and in that URL you'll see all of the parameters uh, as part of the URL that get sent along with the get request so for example when we say we want to go to bank.com transaction uh, and then I'm going to pass along in the URL the fact that I want it to, to <laughs> basically transfer some money to this account of this amount so that's a get request if it was a post request, you wouldn't see all of these details because they get sent along as like like form fields instead. So you, you would just see this part in the URL, for example. Um, so officially, get requests shouldn't make any state changes. So if you've got a get request in your website, you're designing a new website, get request should just retrieve information. They shouldn't be making any state changes to a server. But actually it's quite common for them too. So it's not it's not unusual, but officially, and if you want to design things as best as possible, you shouldn't. This is just missing a little SRC equals here. But you can see here an, an attack can be to include an image tag with source equals and then that um, that URL, and it will the browser will happily load that up for you in the background, which will, regardless of what website is hosting that, the um, cookie from this domain 
will get sent along, which means that the request will be uh, like considered to be authorized and allowed. So let's have a quick look at this example. So looking at damn vulnerable web app again as um, to do some some demos. Can look here. Um, this website lets me change my password. And so if I want to change my password to test and change to put that same password in, I click change and it's changed it for me. But if I look in the URL here or if I looked in Zap, I'd see that basically it's sent along this request, which includes it's a get request, as all the details are sent along in the URL uh, as parameters, but basically uh, setting the new password, confirming the password, and making a change. So if we you know, wanted to send that along separately, uh, you, know, you can see here I could just change it to set the password to something else and run it, and it will happily change it, regardless of whether, um, you know, so basically I just need to trick the web browser into doing that. And so, see here, this example website, I've literally just got a, um, so there's an HTML document, it's got a body that just has literally one image embedded in it, and the source of that request. So, okay, pretty straightforward. And then as soon as they browse to that website, what they're going to see is a broken image because it's not really an image. But if we hit refresh on that, it has now literally just changed my password. Um, and so even though this is not hosted on the same website, this is a separate server that's running compared to the um, this, this one here that I'm connected to. So it's on a separate server uh, hosting an image that happens to link to a request on this website and it's just changed my password just from hitting refresh. So that's an example of a cross-site request forgery attack. So the other kind of um, request, and if you're doing it right, you should send any state changing request via a post request instead of get. Um, and once upon a time, it was thought that it was safe from CSurf vulnerabilities because Basically, you can't just construct a link that you get someone to click on. You um, so it was a, at one point, people were saying, well, actually, this is a safe way to do it. If we just use post, everything's fine. But actually, no. Actually, it's quite vulnerable because all you need to do is get a website to automatically submit a post request, which is actually really straightforward. So you can have uh, a website that just submits a HTML form, literally a couple of lines of code that just says, Here's a form, submit it. Uh, and then as soon as they visit that website, it submits. Uh, likewise, in the JavaScript I said before, you can use do like an Ajax query to submit a submit post request. Uh, there are some other um, HTTP methods. They're not that common with when you're visiting websites, but if you're using like RESTful APIs and things, sometimes there are other kinds of um, HTTP requests. And some of them are actually a lot safer because web browsers will actually enforce that it has to come um, from the same domain that the request has to come from. So there will be some extra um, controls that are automatically in place based on the same origin policy. Um, so I want to give you a few examples so you can see that this is a very real threat. So for example, ING Direct the bank had cross-site uh, cross request forgery vulnerabilities in basically in their whole website, internet banking website. This is a few years ago. Um, does anyone here happen to bank with ING? No. Um, and it, you know, they, basically they had no defenses against cross-site request forgery like the, <laughs> like the examples we just gave. And you could literally send the request and as long as they were logged into their internet banking from another website that they had loaded in another tab you could do all of the internet banking requests that you liked so you could send the money to someone you could um, you know do whatever you wanted within the internet banking website so um, I don't know if they thought it was a defense but there were some steps some things that you had to do with multiple steps 
So you have to type one thing in, you click next, and then you type another thing in and answer the questions and click next. That's not a defense. Like having multiple steps is not a defense against this because you can just script or send one request, wait a few seconds, send the next request. Um, and so, yeah, vulnerable internet banking. Another example, I wanted to find some examples for you with just some bug bounties. Um, there was an example where someone, basically Facebook does use uh, what I'm about to just talk about in a minute, uh, tokens to try and prevent uh, these kinds of attacks. But they weren't checking the tokens in one specific page on Facebook and it was like a account migration page. And via that one page or uh, URL, you could actually send other Facebook commands through it. So it, would, it allowed you, you to do like relative uh, queries against other commands on Facebook. And basically, they could do anything. So from this one page that forgot to check the tokens, you could basically make any request in Facebook, like post messages or delete photos or whatever, through, through you know, basically one page error. Uh, they were awarded uh, 15,000 US dollars for reporting that. Um, PayPal, um, this is, a, I guess, a smaller example where PayPal.me had a um, cross-site request forgery vulnerability where they didn't check the tokens uh, and so someone could change someone else's profile picture. Um, you know, by, again, you create the appropriate command. It was a post command. You can see the little bit of code here that it takes. So there's a hidden form here. It's like a form. Uh, and it basically just <laughs> submits that form. That's how you create the post request from, a, from an HTML file. Basically, if someone else, someone's logged into PayPal and they visit that website with that bit of code, change their profile picture. Uh, they got 750 US dollars uh, bug bounty. Some other examples. Netflix had a flaw that would allow you to alter login credentials so you could compromise accounts. Uh, YouTube have had cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities that basically allowed almost any action on YouTube. So you could, you know, whatever, you could control someone else's YouTube account by getting them to visit your website. Um, to, yeah, to do basically anything on their site. So those are some examples of some really high profile websites and flaws uh, and some less high profile, I guess, like the changing profile picture. But you can see it's, you know, it's common, it's an easy mistake to make uh, and it can have some really se serious security ramifications. So how do you stop these attacks from working and happening? Well, as a client, like as a person that uses the internet, one of the things you can do is not click links you don't trust. Um, so don't visit websites you don't trust. Now, that kind of advice might not be a very good corporate policy as this is your defense against someone messing with your web server is to say, well, don't, don't click on anything. Like, true, that is part of a lot of the security ed education that we do tend to give people. Uh, is like a layer, I guess, is like, don't click on links you don't trust because bad things can happen. But in, rea in reality, there's plenty of times when you do click on links and they're useful and it can be it can be quite easy to trick someone to, to either clicking a link and even if you manage to convince them not to do that, there's so many ways that you can get their web browser to do something. So yes, it's a valid thing to try and get people to think about what they're doing when they're browsing the internet. Um, but I think most of the onus of this problem is actually with the people that are managing these websites to make sure that they're secure. Um, because generally speaking, we try our best to get clients not to do silly things, but people are people. So the people are bound to do things that you don't want them to do. Um, you can install browser plugins and things which will limit some of these kinds of cross-site requests from happening, but you'll break the internet in the process. So you can install something like NoScript, which will stop JavaScript like scripts from running in web pages you load, a bunch of the websites that you love and you know like will stop working, but you'll be slightly more secure. Yeah. Uh, Firefox have recently added in container support. Mm -hmm. There's a plugin built upon that, which if you click a link which hasn't been used, have it opens it in its own separate container to prevent anything from happening. Container, as in. I mean, it, 
effectively in a continuing pr private realm, you have just about oh, okay. all in place. That's good. I mean, that that is a, a good practical um, solution. So you've got yeah, so you've got certain links that you'll click that will open up essentially in its own private tab. Um, but yeah, so I mean, so that's good. But I guess you need, as the web developer, you have to have thought about the fact that you want to do that. Um, and again, websites that don't think of those sorts of things and don't have those defenses, it might not help very much. But also, I guess opening in a private tab is would help. So for example, if you're visiting a website that you don't trust, if you opened it in a private tab, if you had closed all of your private tabs and then open a fresh private tab and then go to a website you don't trust, then there's um, less damage it can do because the links that you follow and things won't be sending along all your cookies. Uh, the other thing you can do is actually at clear your cookies and log out of websites when you're not using them. But again, that's like a usability trade-off of, you know, are you going to be logging out of Facebook each time you're not sending a message? And then you need to log into it again when you want to send a message. I don't think that's how most people use their computers. But it would make you more secure against these vulnerabilities when they come up in the websites that you use. So there's some things that you can do to try and protect yourself. And one is just being wary of, you know, what what you what you're clicking on. But I think really most of the work needs to happen on the server end. And <coughs> servers can check the headers to try and detect that something is not what they're expecting in terms of when requests aren't coming from the origin that they expect. So Web um, web browsers will send across a bunch of headers when you make a request. Now headers are not usually a very secure thing to rely on because you can easily, a client can change the headers. But if you are a cross-site request forgery attack, it's not straightforward to alter certain headers where the web browser won't let you alter them. So that basically it's not always secure, it's not foolproof, but it's better than nothing, is to check that the command, the, the query that's coming makes sense. So you can look at the origin header and the referrer header, um, they're very similar. The difference is the origin is just the server and port number. Um, the referrer tells you like the web page that they were on before this thing got initiated. And if those things don't match the actual website that you're sending the <laughs> command to when you don't expect it to sometimes it doesn't matter but if, if it's something you it's an action you're trying to protect you might that might be enough to say no I'm not gonna allow that but it's not it's not foolproof um, so a much better solution is to have some kind of values that get sent along with um, requests that basically proves that the attacker is you or has your authority um, and most of the defenses that are designed around that idea basically embeds the tokens into the websites it gives you um, or it gets generated on the client side. Um, and then basically when the client makes a request, um, you know, it needs to know those token values in order to generate the request. So an attacker who is crafting this thing, and again, unless they've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability on your website, they don't get insight into any of that stuff that's going on on the website. So they need to try and guess all of these tokens. And if it's impossible or hard for them to do that, then that is a defense against against it. So the, if you're depending on what framework or technologies you're using to build your website, they often will include some kind of defense mechanisms that you can like use or enable. Some of them literally just as soon as you're using a framework, it will automatically do this stuff for you. Um, but yeah, what I was talking about is essentially called um, so cross-site request forgery tokens or form keys or synchronizer token patterns. And basically where you load the website from the server and the server will generate tokens that get embedded into the website that you've just visited so that when you then send the request from that website, it will send those tokens back and the server will know that it was you that um, that was initiating that action. And if an attacker wanted to try and craft that kind of attack, they would need to figure out what those tokens were, which shouldn't shouldn't be possible if everything is, you know, right. 
So you can also, you often see tokens that get embedded in URLs, but it's not like for get requests, but it's not the best because there are various points where all of that's, all those tokens get exposed. So if a website ever has a link through to an external website, the referrer header that gets sent along and then stored in that external website's logs will include all the tokens that were in the URL string. So it's better not to use GET requests for um, for this, but it does it does happen and it's better than nothing. Um, but there are times in which it's not good because you'll be exposing those tokens. Um, and that is the approach used by Drupal, for example, with the co uh, content management system. Okay, I have to say this is objectively funny. Uh, <laughs> um, and that, I, know, I, I know usually I'm the only one that thinks the pictures are funny, but that, that is pretty funny. Good. Cookie to header. Um, so the relies on, um, so the idea in this solution is that you have a cookie and it might just be generated by the client, but that the cookie also gets replicated in the header that gets sent in the requests. And it makes it very hard for the, for the attacker to be able to guess the token uh, so that they can also place it in the header. So if there's a cookie, um, it, it's, yeah, it can be, the, it makes it pretty much um, very, very hard for the attacker to, to circumvent that. And it's very lightweight because you don't have to maintain any state on the server side. Um, and that's the solution used by various uh, JavaScript frameworks like AngularJS. So, I guess the one I mentioned it a few times, but if there's ever any cross-site scripting on the same domain, it doesn't even have to be on the same website, but if it's on the same domain, so it's hosted on that same server, um, then it can circumvent all of the above defenses against um, CSERF. So, basically, you, you really don't want to have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, not only because they're bad, but because when you've got a cross-site scripting vulnerability, you essentially, you know, as I mentioned when we talked about that a few weeks ago, a cross-site scripting vulnerability implies that you can send any requests you like, basically. You basically can take control of that website because you've got visibility, you can see all the tokens, you can craft responses that have those tokens in it, and you can essentially um, do all sorts of things, uh, and it renders most of these protections useless. Um, because yeah, JavaScript can just read all these tokens. Another defense is to use user interaction. So it's not enough to be multi-step. I explained why I read, uh, earlier. But you can have challenge response defenses like getting someone to type their password again, um, entering a capture that proves that they're not like an automated bot. Uh, you can get people to type in one-time passwords or user authentication tokens. So like when you do your internet banking, you have to get your little token thing out. You, um, you know, type into that and then you copy the thing on into your computer. That can be an effective defense. Um, but it's quite a user experience and usability problem if they have to constantly be like dealing with these uh, like external tools and tokens and retyping their password in a hundred times. You know, it can, um, you know, <coughs> it, it's, yeah, it's a defense, but it, it's not the ideal defense in a lot of situations. So one way that you can go about it to get a middle ground kind of defense against it is something like uh, PayPal, where if you want to, someone to be able to pay money to you or to transfer money to someone, you can actually create a link that does that and you can share it with the world. But when you click on it to actually visit that link, it will then ask you to log in, to verify, like to authenticate, to verify that that's actually what you wanted. Are you sure that's what you want? Okay, type your password in and then it uses the um, tokens and things to defend against that interaction um, to send the, the, you know, that final confirmation through. So detection can be very hard if you haven't built the defenses in from the start because it looks the same. So someone, you know, I can go to that website 
that, sh that on the Jam Vulnerable web app where it asked me to type a new password in. And if that actually is how that website worked, I could just have that tab open for quite a long time and eventually I'll type into it and click submit. And you look at a log file that says I've changed my password versus what that looks like, it's not much different. I guess you look back in time, you can look at the referrer. Maybe it's going to be blank if I'm sending the request through directly via the web browser or from somewhere else. It might be a sign. Um, there are, maybe you see things happening in an order that you wouldn't expect it to, the way that people normally use your website. And if requests are coming through in an odd order, that might be a sign that something's wrong. But really, you need to get on top of this and design it in the first place to, in order to be able to prevent it. So in conclusion, uh, CSurf can enable attackers to trick users or, or web browsers into misbehaving. Um, and base, if the, the server's not doing anything to check the requests, um, then that, you know, you're going to be vulnerable. And also, you need to make sure you don't have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities as well. Um, so yeah, that is cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities.